Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Unity Hour. I think this is a very anticipated Unity Hour. Um, if you're new to the MOM Project, Unity Hour is our virtual event series where we wind down every Friday and um, with an expert and a specific topic. I just want to let you all know this session will be recorded, so do not worry. It will be recorded. Today, I am extremely thrilled to host Dr. Harvey Karp and Dr. Jasmine McCoy in our Are the Kids All Right session. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Hiba. I'm the social media manager here at The Mom Project. I've kind of been taken over Unity Hour for my colleague, Katie, who is on maternity leave. I also have Tiffany here, who is co-hosting with me today. Um, and she's best known on The Mom Project team as running Rally and Unity. And we'll have uh, links to those programs in the chat, uh, just in case you need to check those out. Um, so let me introduce to you guys, Dr. Harvey Karp, who's one of America's most trusted pediatricians and child, uh, child development expert, as well as the founder and CEO of Happiest Baby. And Dr. Jasmine McCoy, who's a clinical psychologist, founder of The Mom Psychologist and author of Let's Talk Discipline and First Time Parents Guide to Potty Training. Today, we'll be getting into questions asked by you guys and explore effective ways to maintain peace, productivity, and family balance as we enter the school year, while many of us are still working from home with kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm throwing it to you, Dr. Jasmine, introduce yourself to the Mom Project community. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it is an honor to be here with you guys during these unprecedented times. Um, like you said, I am a clinical psychologist. I specialize in child development, pa positive parenting, um, as well as maternal mental health. Um, I have a private practice. I'm also pretty active on social media, especially Instagram and YouTube. And through my online community, I just strive to help parents connect, understand their little ones. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> Thank you. And then Dr. Harvey. Thank you, Hiva. Um, so I'm a pediatrician, uh, practiced for many, many years uh, out here in, in Southern California in Santa Monica, and then began kind of observing some things that, um, that uh, helped me a lot in taking care of babies and, and toddlers in the practice. And um, there's a book, Happiest Baby on the Block and Happiest Toddler on the Block. Um, and then that led to creating a new type of a baby bed called SNU that came out a couple of years back um, that is a robotic kind of responsive baby bed that adds an hour or two to a baby's sleep um, and also keeps babies safely uh, on the back. So we're, our goal is really to improve safety for infants as well. Um, I always would like to tell my patients that really my job is half being a doctor and half being a grandmother because um, I think uh, parents today, especially in Los Angeles, we would see all the time that they are away from their extended family. And, and oftentimes people are so invested in their work and their professions that, uh, oh my God, I forgot to learn about children. <laughs> I have children and now I have to learn about it. And so uh, a lot of what I would do is really kind of carrying the ancient wisdom forward and helping people with common sense approaches to, to handling the, the travails of parenting. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. And I'm going to now toss it to Tiffany, who's going to be doing the interview portion of this fireside chat. So take it away, Tiffany. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so we do have some of the pre-submitted questions, but feel free to chime in on chat or throw any extras in there. We're keeping an eye and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible in the time we have. And I think I'm going to start with this one um, about, do you all have any suggestions that can help encourage independent play and learning in children? And also at what age is that realistic? I think it's very impactful right now with children at home and some learning and some playing. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Jasmine. Sure. I can, okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I love this question. I think now more than ever, we should be focusing on promoting independent play with our little ones. I would say you can start this process at around six months um, and then you'll gradually work your way up to more and more time. Of course, the time will increase as your child gets older. So to answer the, I'll answer the second question and then the first question, but I would say around 18, 24 months, we're looking at anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes of course, you know, this is going to depend largely on your child's temperament, um, but start practicing and working your way up because 
independent play has so many great benefits to your child's development, as well as, of course, you <laughs> and on a practical level. But, you know, it helps them become more reliant, more creative. It gives them time to explore the environment at their own pace, which is really, really important to their learning, their imagination, um, their concentration and focus. So the ways, you know, that you could there's so many I have so many ideas on this, but I think what it comes down to is practicing as parents kind of taking a step back, letting your child lead a little bit more. I think there's this pressure. We need to entertain them. We need to stimulate them all the time. We need to be fun and exciting all the time. But actually, when we're playing for our child, we're actually um, taking away from their ability to learn how to independently play. So I would say focus on taking a step back, letting them lead, follow their lead, um, try to incorporate daily one-on-one time, and then you'll slowly start inching away. (laughs) It's going to be gradual, of course, um, depending on your child. Um, but you'll want to make playtime a regular part of the routine and then slowly start to build in more and more time for independent play. Uh, again, I have more ideas, but Harvey, I'd love to hear your ideas as well. Well, I just want to underscore what you said, especially a couple of points. One is about temperament, um, that um, it isn't just like I have a 12 month old and now I'm going to teach them independent play. It depends on your child. Some kids are very content to sit there and they'll, you know, they'll play with the blocks for, you know, 20 minutes because they have a long attention span and other kids will be there for four seconds and then they're throwing the blocks and eating the blocks. And so, um, so you have to understand the, and play the cards you're dealt. Um, and um, that's the starting point. The, the second thing um, to really underscore what, what you said, Jasmine, is the idea about dancing together, that, um, that it isn't a one and done, you don't learn it and then it's, it's accomplished. You know, every day is different. Um, kids go through moods and hunger or they slept well or they didn't sleep well. And, um, and so uh, you always have to be flexible in your expectations. I, I would tell my patients that if they had a bumper sticker, it would say, be flexible or die, you know, because when you're, <laughs> Taking care of young uh, young children, it's it's really it's a roller coaster ride. Um, the other thing about dancing with each other is, um, to your point, Jasmine, is letting them lead. It isn't you leading everything. You're not the entertainment coordinator and the social, you know, the social um, 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 leader of the family. I mean, and you are, of course, and sometimes that's your role to take, and sometimes it's it's the opportunity to give that up. Um, and, um, so a couple of ways that you can help to encourage those things, especially with young children, in a way, if you think about the way the brain works and you've got two halves of the brain, right? You've got the, the, the right half, which is the more emotional and, and, and it's uh, related to musicality and it's related to emotionality and it's related to nonverbal communication. So tone of voice and, and gestures of your face. And you have the left half, which is the more adult half, which is language and problem solving and um, delayed gratification and, and focus and attention. So a lot about independent play has to do with developing that left half of the brain, and especially the left front part, which we call the, the executive function of the brain. And so a couple of things that parents can do to help their young kids um, mature a little bit faster, that part of the brain are... Um, one technique called patient stretching, which is a concept where you almost give your child what they want and at the last second, you don't give it to them. It sounds like a tease, but it isn't really if you do it right. So for example, the child wants a cracker, you know, mommy, 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 and and you're gonna give them a cracker, you know? So you reach over, you, you hand the cracker to them just as they're about to take it from your hand, you go, oh wait, one second, honey, one second, one second. And you turn around or pretend to be busy with something just for five seconds or whatever. And then you turn to them and go, good waiting, good waiting. Here's your cracker. Then you do that again. You might do this five or 10 times a day even. And what happens is over several days, your child learns. They're learning machines, right? They learn that, you know, when my mom goes one second, one second, then I'm pretty much going to get what I want. They just have to wait a little bit of time. Five seconds is not such a big deal. And then 10 and then 15 and then 30 seconds. And what you're doing is you're building your child's ability to endure the um, or delay the gratification that they have to get that thing that they want. And so believe it or not, that simple little trick within a week or two can build a child's ability to, to spend time on their own or to have that independent play 
um, for a much longer period and, and ultimately for many, many minutes. Um, and then the other thing is, is mindfulness. And there are lots of ways of teaching mindfulness or meditation or really breathing exercises for little kids. Um, uh, other, other little games that you play to help them learn that control of themselves and be able to, to withhold or hold back their impulsivity is like a, you know, a red light, green light game, you know, where you where or stop and go games or freeze tag games where, where they have to control the impulse to run. Um, and ultimately with, with mindfulness breathing, um, I really just do it the way a conductor conducts um, uh, an orchestra, which is a big breath in and then a big breath out. And you literally guide them for the breathing in and out. And breathing out always needs to be longer than breathing in. That's when the relaxation starts happening. So that's those are just some simple little tricks and tips that you can do on a daily basis that, that over a week into period will, will make a difference in terms of, of a child's ability to do independent play. Thank you for sharing those. And Dr. Jasmine, I just want to go back to something that you were talking about, which is this idea of independent play coupled with one-on-one um, -on -one time with a parent. So I just would love to hear mm. both of your thoughts on how much quality time do you think kids <laughs> need with an active adult in order to thrive per week? And what does that look like for you know working parents? Yeah, this is a question that I get a lot. Um, I think a lot of parents are struggling and concerned with, you know, how much is enough time? You know, I don't know about you, Harvey, but I'm not aware of a strong literature on the, you know, the exact time um, that parents should be um, with their child or engaging or play time. I do know that, you know, I recommend starting with five to 10 minutes of one-on-one -on -one play time per day. I like to think of per day versus a week um, because I I think, you know, it's similar to when we're exercising or trying to build a new skill. It's a lot better if we do it every day um, than doing it, you know, sporadically or for 30 minutes a couple times a week, right? Um, this helps on a lot of different levels, but um, especially with our children, they can learn to expect when um, they will have our one-on-one -on -one time, right? It's built into the routine. And it's also a small dose. It makes it very manageable for us as parents. I know more than ever, we are stressed. We have a lot on our plate right now. So five, 10 minutes, I would say start there um, and you can work your way up. Yep, again, totally agree. I think that one of the issues that you, when you put yourself in, in the shoes of these little kids, you realize that um, we take some things for granted that they don't really know. And one of those things is telling time. Uh, you know, what time is it? Uh, when are we having lunch? You know, when are, when is when is uh, daddy going to come home or mommy going to come home? Or when is brother or sister going to come home from school when we hopefully will have school again? Um, or um, when will mommy be off her Zoom call? You know I mean, uh, different issues like that. Um, and so different strategies for helping children be able to understand time, to put a, a frame around it, to make it tangible are things that are helpful for parents of young children. Um, one way, for example, is to use a timer. And so you can, in, you, and you can involve the child in turning on the timer as well, you know, pressing the button and then turning it off when the dinger rings. Timers are great for little kids because it really helps them understand a beginning, middle and an end. And um, um, so when it comes to, to to one-on-one -on -one time, uh, or I, I would call it special time. It's always good to put little labels on things so that um, it is, it's marketing. In essence, you're marketing to your toddler, but you want them to understand that this is something of value. This is not just time that we spent together. This is your special time. And even having uh, little songs, you can make up your own song, you know, it's Bobby's special time, special. You know I mean? You make it something that is, packaged and um and then you set the timer and whether it's five minutes or three minutes or eight minutes or whatever it is that's reasonable for your family the the amount of time is is only part of the the gift that you're giving it's really this ritual this predictability and this understanding that it is just 
the two of you together and nobody else is going to bug you at that period and the telephone is off and you know big brother big sister is a different location and and it's just you know um intimate time together I actually think it's kind of good to do that even twice a day if you can, even if it's three minutes twice a day, you know, whatever fits into your schedule. But that predictability becomes a, a safe harbor for a child. Um, one of the things that's really cool um, that parents can establish for their kids are routines and rituals. Rituals are routines that have some special ceremonies around them and that are completely predictable. And so that could be around brushing teeth or you always sit down and, and clasp hands and say a prayer when you, when you have your lunch um, or, um, um, you know, when we get dressed in the morning, we put on shoes, then then we run in a circle three times before we go outside. <laughs> the rituals don't have to have any special, you know, meaning other than the fact that it's something that allows a child to be as smart as everybody else in the room, because they know if I do this ritual, I know exactly what's happening next. And so, um, so when you do the special time, if you have a little song or you have a special place that you do it, if your child likes to read books and you have a special nook that you always go to for that, they will feel confident and reassured and safe and smart when they know exactly what's gonna happen. Yes, yes, routines build that resilience, right? Mm -hmm. And it helps them feel safe. I was also too gonna add, you know, rather than focusing on quantity, I would also focus on quality. Quality is really important. That is one of the big predictors uh, research has shown in terms of parent-child interactions is the quality of your interactions. And I would say, you know, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like there's too much on your plate, hold off on playtime. And, you know, until you've kind of filled your cup up because your child will sense that when you're kind of distracted, kind of short, um, you're not really into it, they're going to pick up on that and that's going to actually hinder the interaction. So try to focus on the quality as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when you when you focus on quality, some of the things, uh, getting back to this social director idea, you don't have to be leading everything. You know, mm -hmm. um, you'll you'll f follow your child's cue if they can tell you what they want to do, um, and then uh, there's a little technique called <clears throat> called um, um, just kind of um, it's really kind of time ends, uh, which is when you're spending time together that you are just um, sitting next to them or maybe going, huh, look at what you did or wow, that's cool. Don't, you don't have to blow it out of proportion. It's not a big deal. You're not feeding them sweets of, you know, compliment after compliment. It's really just your attention is the biggest compliment to them because you're their mm -hmm. rock star, right? You're, you're the most important person in their lives. So just kind of being next to them and going, hmm, wow, or mm, like that, you know, something like that, just toss it off is so, so nurturing for little kids. Yes, yes. And I would say too, if you're struggling with building in playtime into the routine, focus on the um, natural routines that you already do. Brushing your teeth, getting ready for a meal, um, going potty, right? Try to build in those connections, like you said, hmm, making those observations, um, narrow it, narrating what's happening in the moment, giving them some praise and encouragement. Don't underestimate too just the, the power of just those, like you said, those one in, quick interactions. Um, during the daily routine that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but give them, as you said, give them your real attention. If you do it, do yes. it. If you can't do it, then you'll do it later. Um, but don't <laughs> do it halfway. Yeah. Um, yes. I want to ask you both, um, is there a specific age group, um, you know, that we could like push this towards? I think a lot of people want to know like which age group would this advice be about or what do you think um, you should do differently for like the younger kids or like people with like a little bit older kids? I think this applies to any child, <laughs> even the babies narrating, narrating what's happening, using your, your um, facial expressions, your tone of voice, right? Um, praising, I would say start this ASAP. Now, of course, for the older kids, 
<laughs> you know, uh, you know, you want to change your technique a little bit and not be too over over the top because of those scents. But I think it comes down to, you know, whether or not your child is six months old or 16, it's the authenticity of the relationship, right? That attunement with them, that connection um, that will, you know, evolve over time um, based on their age. Right. No, I totally agree with that. And, and of course, as they get older, they have more, more optionality, even with a little one, you want to give options, right? You know, mm -hmm. you want the blue cup or the red cup, or, you know, uh, should we put your shoes on first or your shirt on first, you know, or whatever. But, um, but um, as they get older, um, it is um, a little bit less effervescent, um, perhaps, and, um, and giving them a little bit more control, a little bit more options. But all of these techniques, rituals, routines, meditative breathing, um, a time ends, um, a special time, all of those things will be valuable for kids well into their, you know, uh, preteens and even into the teens. Thank you. I think we'll switch a little bit into a topic that's pretty top of mind for people and um, it's remote learning or <laughs> going back to school. And some people are, have written in and they're just curious how we can keep kids in general motivated and engaged with remote learning uh, when as a working parent, your days are already packed. And um, particularly, are there any strategies you can provide for single parents or maybe parents who have uh, other support that's not in the home with them to help throughout the day? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's obviously a huge, huge challenge. Um, it's, you know, now on top of all your other jobs, now you're not just a social entertainer, you're also the educator, you're the teacher, you're the classmate. It's like, Wow, I, it's given us all such appreciation for, for childcare providers, for teachers, for all of those folks that have been helping us raise our children um, this whole time. And, um, and, and really recognizing, uh, you know, not, not only what a value they are, but how well they should be compensated and, and how we need to kind of take another look at how we value different jobs in our society. Um, but um, one, just one idea for the e-learning that can make it a help is, is to try to have, um, bring groups together. And I don't mean that in terms of in your home because we still wanna maintain social distancing, but to have Zoom calls where kids can have, you know, two kids or even three kids on a call who are sharing the same learning experience. Um, and that really gives a lot of, um, of extra value to the child because they're sharing that with their friends, they can interact with their friends, it makes it much more interesting because we all know the so this is not just fill their brains with, with knowledge and facts, this is really a social environment and the more social interaction they have, the more the, the, the knowledge becomes relevant and becomes interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say to, you know, acknowledging with your child how difficult this is, <laughs> how many changes there have been in such a short amount of time and how it can be hard to engage and stay motivated um, when you're, you're used to being in a classroom around your peers and around teachers and in a community, essentially. I love that practical tip, though, of learning together. Um, I think, too, you know, trying as best as possible offer choices, like how you mentioned, Harvey, you know, would you like to work on this first or this? Um, you know, and trying to keep the communication open with them, you know, again, acknowledging this is hard, this is different. Um, what will make this better for you? Um, what are you struggling with? Is there a particular area you're struggling with that we can get you help? Is that what's interfering with your motivation? Um, is it the way you're learning? Is it what you're learning? Um, and I think, you know, not losing sight of the fact that we can't really recreate the learning environment. That's really impossible. So, keeping in mind our expectations um, and, you know, shooting on ourselves and being careful not to do that um, as parents. And um, yeah, just keeping that, keeping that communication open, offering choices, giving them maybe like a list. Okay, which one, we gotta get all of this done today. Which one would you like to do first, second and third can help with their motivation. Absolutely. I think also um, keeping charts, keeping records, you know, for all of us, one day blends into the next, and it's hard to really remember what we've done and what we've accomplished. And I think for kids, having a running log 
um, that uh, can help them see what they've been able to do and, and allow you to see what they've been able to do and give them praise for that, or at least acknowledgement for, um, for, for what they've accomplished. I think that's really helpful for kids because we, we lose track of all of that. Um, one, mm-hmm. other, um, one other thing I think that's helpful is making, making the lessons relevant to your everyday life, if at all possible. And so when kids do have e-learning, um, trying to take some of the concepts or even one of the concepts that, that you're learning about in school and uh, figure out a little project or a way to associate that with the life at home, whether it's you know, the growing of a plant or digging in the dirt and finding worms or, you know, um, um, or cooking and what happens when water boils. I mean, you, you want to try to associate the learning, which is really just good learning anyway. That's actually one of the, one of the bad things about learning in class is it's all sitting there and learning and it's not as much experiential learning. Um, and so really trying to find ways, and it doesn't have to be a lot of these things, just really one of the, one idea from the lesson of the day um, is, is plenty, or even two or three a week is plenty for kids to really get excited because they're, they're not just learning something, they're actually practically learning how that affects the world around them. Yes, yes, I love that. And I was I was going to say that too, learning can happen anywhere, right? It happens everywhere. And especially for the elementary school kids, play, don't underestimate the power of play. I'm such a huge fan of play. I know it maybe seems to our adult brain that they're just, they're just playing, they're not learning anything, but actually play builds the essential brain pathways um, and helps with learning valuable skills like creativity, ingenuity, problem solving, right? Social skills. I know a lot of us are are concerned about our child's social skills, but playing helps with that, especially um, doing the free play and the uh, role playing. Um, so don't underestimate to the power of play in their learning overall. That's so true. Now, and if you have a if you have a single child and you're not able to um, you know have that type of um, a play exposure, one thing to consider kind of sound crazy coming from a pediatrician, but one thing to consider is to get a dog, um, to really have a playmate. You know, the social isolation is just one of these tough, tough things. And um, and um, you can't, especially if you have a one and a two and a three-year-old, four-year-old, it's just exhausting to be coordinating their whole day. If they can run after the dog and the dog run after them, you know, for you know, for a large part of the day, it ends up being a lot of fun for them. It's uh, maybe it's not it's not cognitive learning, but it is motoric learning and a lot of fun on top of that. And it will really um, be a, an extra source of affection and interaction, which is something I think that we all need during these COVID days. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love that, I love that idea. Um, And I think too, for for single parents particularly, um, I know you guys are up against a a, a huge challenge, right? Um, And I think, you know, in psychology, we have a term, uh, radical acceptance. And it doesn't mean we like what's happening or we agree with it, but we accept it without judgment. And I think a lot of this, um, a lot of this can benefit from that acceptance piece. Um, And, you know, including the feelings that come up of, you know, helplessness of feeling overwhelmed. Um, A really practical piece um, is giving your child visual cues. Uh, so you even can, you know, like Harvey said, set a timer. Um, there's a lot of good timers out there to, to let your child know, okay, I'm, I'm working now. This is your solitary time. Um, or, you know, setting a, um, a, gr- p- a green piece of paper on the door or a red piece of paper just to signify in a very visual way. Um, these are the boundaries here. This is when I'm working. This is when I'm not. Of course, you're supervising your child and going back and forth. But um, these are really, really tough times for, for single parents um, in, per- in particular. In particular, yeah. Yeah, and and pat yourself on the back. I mean, yes. this is a once in a century kind of terrible situation right now. I mean, it is it is extraordinary. You're living through extraordinary times, and you're a survivor. You're a great mom and a great dad, being able to to just cope with this. I mean, everybody's got so many issues that four months ago never would have crossed their mind as happening in their lives, and so. Um, it does throw you for a loop and it's a time. And that's part of the reason why, even though pediatricians are really eager for kids to get back in school, um, 
we don't want parents to think that they have to be these master teachers and their job is to <clears throat> is to kind of even keep up with the school year curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. You'll make up for things in, in terms of life experience and in terms of interactions that you now, that's part of the richness of what's going on now is you do have an opportunity to see your child much more and to be with your child much more, which is a burden of course, but it is a, it is a, a, a kind of a reward as well. But um, but to, to Jasmine's point, you know, we, we, we I love that term, don't should on yourself about everything you should be doing, because just getting through the day and keeping your kids safe and fed and healthy is an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> and you want to you want to pat yourself on the back for that. Yes, yes. And acknowledge, you know, if you are in survival mode, that's okay. Like you said, focus on the basics, right? Good nutrition, sleep, safety, and a little bit of exercise. If you've accomplished it, you know, a little bit of those things, you're, do you're doing great. <laughs> and actually speaking of sleep, but sleep affects all sorts of parts of your, your day and your resilience and your ability to learn and your patience and your, or your lack of patience. Um, one thing that parents can do that's super easy, hardly costs a penny, is to use white noise to help their kids sleep at night. And a white noise machine or a white noise um, track from the internet, there's all sorts of ways of getting this, um, again, totally for free. And, um, and the trick is, if you haven't used white noise before, a um, couple of things you need to know. Number one, what white noise does in part is kind of compete with all the chatter that's going on in your brain. And so little kids, you know, they worry. And when they see you worry, they worry even more and they can wake up in the middle of the night and have issues. Um, but if they have this white noise, sound like rain on the roof sound um, going on in their bedroom all night long, and you kind of have it about as loud as a shower, um, it competes with their own uh, internal um, dialogue and oftentimes can help them sleep better and get through the night better. And for adults as well, a lot of adults sleep better with white noise going on. But if you've never used white noise before, there's something that's important, two things that are important to know. One, don't start it when you go to sleep at night. Start it an hour before bedtime. So have it in the background so that your brain kind of gets used to it. So it's not such an abrupt, sudden change in the room. Otherwise it can be kind of annoying. And the second thing is the sound has to be fairly low pitched. Um, if it's too hissy, too that's kind of annoying as well. So you want something that's a little bit more rumbly sounding. And if you have to, you can even wrap a sweatshirt or a sweater around the speaker that you're using. So that muffles the sound a little bit. And so that within two or three or four days can really help kids get that little bit more sleep, an extra half hour or 40 minutes of sleep that can, that can, can really move things in a better direction. Oh, yes, yes. Sleep is so important. Uh, we still use a sleep machine over here, too. <laughs> I have a two and three year old. <laughs> oh, there you go. Still okay. big fans of the sleep machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of adults use. I mean, I, I've used it for years myself. So a lot of it, a lot of parents use it. It's really like using a pillow. It's kind of a pillow of sound, you know, so it's not like you're making your child dependent or addicted. As a matter of fact, Pillows are a lot more addicting <laughs> than white noise. White noise, at least you can gradually reduce it when you want to and get rid of it. But um, so it's a, it's a great little trick that can be helpful. Thank you. So one of the questions that we were curious about is balancing e-learning with also wanting to limit screen time. And I feel like I've already heard some really great suggestions from you all about incorporating lessons into everyday life. But I just wondered if you had any extra advice or suggestions for how you can create a balance for screen time when now so much of learning is happening with the help of a screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, my biggest first and foremost is relax on the screen time uh, guilt. <laughs> I think it's so easy, especially now. I mean, we already suffered with a lot of guilt about screens before this pandemic and now even more so. Um, so, I mean, for me personally, I don't know about you, Harvey, but relax on the guilt and the expectations around screens. But 
you know, as you do that, yeah, and you give yourself more permission for that, for your child being on more and more screens. I think, especially now, we have great weather. Um, it's about getting them outdoors as much as possible um, because there's so many great benefits to physical exercise and being outdoors in nature, not only for our physical health, but our mental health. Um, and like you said, there's, you know, learning happens everywhere. So, you know, digging up worms or finding leaves or finding butterflies flies, um, using those moments as you're outside to um, create learning experiences can be helpful for, for the kiddos. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, I think that um, screen, you know, number one, there's screen time and there's screen time, right? I mean, some of that is quite valuable and thank God for screens. And some of it is is trash and you want to protect your child from it or, or it's, it's kind of visual candy and you want to kind of limit that. Um, and you can, you're allowed to, you're the, you're the parent, but do not get into this trap that you're a bad parent if you're using screens, because right now it is survival mode and, and it's, it's entertainment. And especially if you don't have, if you have a single kid and you don't have a dog, um, you know, they need entertainment. They need exposure to other people and something that's dynamic and changing. So, um, but you can also make deals, you know, and once your child gets to be really over three and four and five and six, you know, you can say, you know, you have to do this to get that. And mm -hmm. um, don't be, don't be too harsh, especially in the beginning when you're doing this kind of make easy deals. So your kids can, can agree with you and, and everyone gets, everyone gets the benefit. But, um, but there are all sorts of deals you can make like, yeah, we, you know, you'll, you're, you can have this next hour of screen time, but before you do that, you have to do X, Y, and Z. I need you to clean the dishes if the kid's old enough or pick up all the toys or um, you have to do your calisthenics, you know, so you need to do your 10 push-ups, your 10 sit-ups, your 10, you know, jumping jacks and whatever. It, it isn't even that important what they're doing. What's more important is that they do something that they feel like they've paid in. They're part of the, part of the, of the, of the company, you know, they are really on the team and they're old enough to participate. And so it's expected that you're going to do some things and then you'll get the benefit of doing those things. Um, and, um, and then kids feel mature and they feel accomplished when, when you give them that opportunity. Yes, yes. I like to recommend to parents to use the when then statement, right? So when you do your chores, whenever, whatever it is, then you get your screen time. It's a nice, nice way to frame that. So they know your expectations and then they know what good is going to come out of it <laughs> once they do that. Totally, totally. But even to do it more um, in a more structured way, where uh, one great thing to do, and especially during these days that are so crazy and there's so many stresses on the family, um, is to have family meetings and, you know, on the weekend or whatever, just have a regular meeting. What went well that week? What do you want to see the next week? You know, are there any initiatives? Are there any new, new deals you want to make with, with your family members, you know, about, you know, this wasn't going so well. So how are we going to, hmm, how are we going to, how are we, do you remember all those dishes that were piling up? I mean, and I didn't have time and, and, and nobody had time to do, well, what should we do this week to try to not have that happen again? And then whatever that agreement is, and if it's related to screen time, that's fine. It's good to kind of tie things together, um, write it down, make a contract, and then you'll revisit it. It doesn't mean that it's written in stone and you're going to get a lawyer involved, but you will come back the next week if it didn't work out and say, well, that didn't quite work out. You know, how can we make that work out better and involve your, your child in that decision making? So they're part of the team and, and their opinion is valued. Um, even if you're not going to end up listening to their opinion, you know, well, what, what, what should, you know, if I have you bring your dish to the, to the sink, um, what should be the reward for that? And they go, I want to go to Disneyland every day, you know, and you'll go, whoa, that would really be fun. Okay. Let's write that down. That might happen maybe. And then you, and then you go through the different things and you go, well, ah, that's not really going to work out. What about, I give you a penny, you know, a shiny penny. And no, I don't want a penny. I want Disneyland. And then you end up negotiating and you find something that's a win-win. And ultimately, you've had a very successful interaction where your child has been valued, where your opinion has been valued, and you make a plan that hopefully moves your family a little bit more in a constructive direction. 
Yes, I love that. And I love that idea of um, family meetings. I think that can also, you know, tying back to being concerned about them being on the screen so much, you can invite them during the meeting to share, okay, what kind of activities do you want to do? Uh, what types of books um, do you want to read? Or what should we check out this coming week around, around the city? Um, get them involved, like you said, in their feedback and their ideas so they feel like a valuable member of, of the family. Yep. Yeah. Listening to both of you talking, I was going to say, Dr. Harvey, I keep thinking, I am a big fan, as I, as I mentioned, of the happiest toddler on the block, and all of your tips are coming back into my brain as I just, we naturally do them in our health after reading them for so long. And Dr. Jasmine, just the way that you have a reframing different situations when it feels very negative to a parent, I would love to hear both of you talk a little bit about how when we're currently stressed out and maybe at our wits end, how we can sort of reframe a situation to handle the stress and not be so strict with our toddlers or with our elementary age children, or even, you know, our older children, we're seeing a lot of different regressions and, and things that um, are, are making us even more stressed out. So do you have advice for handling those situations or, or calming ourselves down maybe? So many ideas there. Dr. Kirk, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, well, you know, I think mindset is, is really everything here. I think a lot of, you know, our, our stress right now, our guilt, our shame, or the overwhelm that we feel is around our mindset and the meaning that we're making from these experiences. I know there was questions about mom guilt and I know, you know, that was already uh, a, a lot of what we're just struggling with. And now with the pandemic and the stress, it can just add to those, those feelings. So I feel like our mindset as parents is, is really, really important. And, and I think it comes down to making sure our expectations <laughs> of ourselves and our little ones is in check with reality, right? Because so often we're like, okay, we should be doing this. Okay, it should look like this. Okay, I have to recreate this learning experience for my child and I'm failing if I don't. Um, or I have to stay on top of all my work projects and all of this that is on our plate, but really keeping our expectations in check because what was normal just six months ago is not what we may be able to keep up with right now during these times. Um, so shifting the expectations, being flexible about it, it, um, and really offer yourself a lot of compassion, <laughs> a lot of compassion uh, um, towards yourself and towards your child. Because like you said, regressions, tantrums, these are all signs of stress um, within our child. So don't be surprised if they're having more potty accidents or they're um, struggling more with behavioral issues and tantrums, because that is how children um, show us that they are uh, stressed and having, and having a hard time. And that's how, you know, we might also be struggling like like you said with sleep uh sleep is so important but we might be struggling with sleep or just getting our basic needs met during these times so i would say so many things to say but i would say make sure our ex expectations are in line <laughs> with reality and um, focusing a lot on basic needs like i said we're kind of in survival mode and that's okay so if anything just make sure those things are, are being met during the day and you're you're doing great <laughs> Super, uh, super advice, I think. With, with the expectations, one thing I would say, I, I think that that is, that is the critical starting point, both with babies and with toddlers. With babies, in, in, in my work at least, the happiest baby on the block, the key concept is that babies are born like four months before they're ready for the world. It's the, the concept of the fourth trimester. And so you hold and rock and shush them and you imitate the womb. And when you know that's your job to be one big walking uterus, you know, for those first four months, then, then it, it all makes sense what the baby responds to. And it gives you a clearer view of what you, what you have to do. For toddlers, um, uh, at least the way I look at them is that toddlers, really are not so much little children as they are um, cavemen. I mean, they're primitives, they're uncivilized. And in fact, our job as parents is to teach them the niceties of civilization, to socialize them, to teach them to say please and thank you and wait in line and share their toys. But they don't, they don't learn that very quickly. I mean, by four and five, you hope they've learned all these lessons of society. And I mean, a one-year-old will know some of them, but they're not gonna be they're not going to be reliable or, or dependable in terms of doing those things. So you need to expect that they're going to have good days and bad days or good moments and bad moments. And when they do spit and scratch or throw something at your head or pee on the floor or, you know, um, 
you know, right with crayons on the wall or something like that, um, that they are just being normal cavemen. And believe me, it's not, it's not, it wouldn't be easy to live with a Neanderthal. You know, I mean, I'm sure they're happy go lucky, but they're not the best roommates. Um, but when you have that in mind, then when, when your child is successful, you'll feel, hey, wow, that you're really doing a good job. And when they're um, having those trying days, you're not gonna judge yourself as being a bad parent or judge your child as being a bad child. You'll understand that this is really just, you know, they're a Neanderthal today. Tied into that then is how you respond to them. And, you know, one of the universal rules that, that I like people to think about, and I, I try in my mind, I would always teach my patients, kind of a, um, a little meme or a little uh, easy way to remember these tools. And, and when it comes to communicating with kids who are really upset or anyone for that matter, who's really upset, there's something called the fast food rule, which is kind of a weird sounding thing. It doesn't mean hamburgers. It means that whoever is hungriest for attention gets to go first. Normally when we're talking back and forth, we take turns. It's called, uh, it's like a tennis match. You know, I go, you go, good morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, how are you? Back and forth. But when someone is upset, the rules change. And whoever is most upset gets to go first and they get a really long turn. And most of us know that, um, know that already because when we're talking to a friend who's upset, we don't, they don't say, oh my God, you're not gonna believe what happened to me. You don't then say, yeah, good morning, how are you? You know, I mean, it's not a back and forth at that point. They've got the stage and they get to talk and your job actually in the beginning is just to acknowledge their feelings. When we say acknowledge feelings so, it turns out you have to do it in a very specific way to be most successful. And, and this is one of the things that I find a lot of parents don't fully understand which is the, the technique I recommend at least is, is something called toddlerese, which is three steps, short phrases, lots of repetition and mirroring a third of their emotion in your tone of voice and gesture. So when your child is upset and you know, um, the peas touch the carrots and now they're melting down because they didn't want the peas to touch the carrots. Um, rather than saying, honey, honey, I know, honey, sweetheart, I know you, I know you're upset. I know the peas touch the carrots. We're, sweetheart, sweetheart, calm down for a minute. We're gonna, we're gonna separate them, just calm down. That's acknowledging feelings, but it's not done in a way that feels respectful to the child because they're feeling feelings up here and you're talking in a way down here of trying to stop their, them from having these big feelings. So you wanna use short phrases, repetition and mirroring a third of their emotion. So it might be something like you, you, I mean, this is like for an 18 month old or a two year old even, you, 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 you don't like it. You don't like it. You say, you say, no, you don't like it. Your, 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 your peas touch your carrot. And you say, no, and you want gestures and you want kind of that almost, almost primitive or, or immature way of speaking. And then as they calm down, your language is gonna get more normal and more mature. And if it's an older child who's five or six or seven, you're not gonna be as immature with your language, but you still will use repetition and some of your tone of voice. So it might be more like, you didn't, you, I can see, honey, I see you are really, 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 really frustrated. You, your face is telling me that. You, your whole body, I can see you're tensed up. You didn't like that. You a thousand percent didn't like that. You a 10,000 percent didn't like that. And I totally get it because why would you like it? See how I'm repeating that over and over again, similar phrases, because the first one or two times you say it, your child doesn't exactly believe it. You know, are you just trying to, yeah, you're just trying to make me feel better or do you really honestly understand how desperately upset I am in this situation? And then after five, six, seven, eight times and they're starting to settle down, that's your opportunity to reassure them or find a solution or problem solve with them or, or something else. You will use this technique 10 times a day, you know, and especially with COVID and everybody at close quarters because everyone gets emotional. And these are techniques you use for your teenager as well as your little kids because it's really just respectful communication.
Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's so hard for children to register language when they are emotionally activated. So I like that, keeping it very simple, right, repetitive, um, because that is the greatest way to calm our, our children down is when they're feeling safe, understood, when they really feel seen and validated by us. Um, and I know it's so easy, you know, our stress response <laughs> goes up as parents and our biggest thing is, okay, just make this stop. How can I make this stop? And we're trying to reason with them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do all of that. But really, if we can just allow it in that moment, um, because I know, I know it sounds crazy, but tantrums are a really healthy part of development. It actually, it, it helps them um, and builds resilience um, over time, if, you know, to go through those moments, especially with you. It's, it can be a, a great um, connecting moment, even though it doesn't always seem like it. <laughs> right. It won't start out that way, maybe. And so, <laughs> right. listen, it's even though we're giving advice and we're giving ideas, in the moment when some little Neanderthal is screaming at you or throwing it at you, it's very hard to keep your poise and to really yes. think all these things. And in fact, I often encourage parents to practice these techniques. All of this stuff, by the way, the things I'm talking about are in The Happiest Toddler on the block. So there's a lot of information there, but I encourage people to practice when their child isn't so upset. In fact, most of us do this automatically when our kids are pretty happy. Like when your child is enjoying breakfast, you don't really say, um, did you enjoy breakfast, sweetheart? You go, mm, yummy, yummy. That's really good. Huh? Isn't that tasty? I know that's your favorite cereal. Um, or, you know, that's kind of the way we speak when they're, when they're very happy and pleased and interested. But when they get upset, we suddenly get more like these little armchair um, psychiatrists or something. We're just trying to talk them off the ledge and to, to settle down. Um, which we will get to, but it's not what you want to do first off when they're melting down. You really want to acknowledge it in a way that feels real and feels respectful of their level of feeling. Yes, yes. And I think one of the first tips can be to, or the one of the things you want to do is ground yourself in those moments, because these moments are very dysregulating for us as parents, especially if we're already stressed, we're already maxed out, we're already multitasking and trying to do all of the things. So grounding ourselves, even some positive mantras, like something as simple as, you know, my child is having a hard time. They're not trying to give me a hard time. You know, we'll get through this <laughs> uh, yeah. together can go a long way and just kind of shifting our mindset. Right, giving yourself a little distance so you're not instantly yes. pulled into the fight. Yeah. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. Not getting sucked in to the emotional windstorm. <laughs> I think a lot of parents, particularly, are curious to know if you feel like this time is going to be scarring for our children. Is there anything that's going to affect them, whether it's um, socialization or learning? It's just all these heavy topics hanging over us and we would love to hear if you feel like this time will be scarring and if there are ways we can help prepare them to avoid any of those situations. Yeah, I think that, you know, again, there's so many worries and so many concerns that are going on. Um, I, I kind of look at it as an opportunity. You know, the the old saying in, in the Japanese, in the Chinese uh, characters that, you um, that danger and opportunity are in the same character. Um, and so ultimately, um, this is really an opportunity to have time with your kids that you will never have again. Um, and so there's, and not that it's not an enormous burden because it is, but, um, but there's something sweet and, and special about it as well that I guarantee there'll be parts of this that people miss when it's all over and kids are back to school and, and that closeness isn't, 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 um, isn't there. Then, then unless you're homeschooling your kids, you know, you're going you're gonna to miss that opportunity. Having said that, um, I think that really the, 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 the burden and the opportunity is to find ways that you can make this um, a rewarding period. Um, and it is extra effort. There's no question on the parents part and it does require more work-life balance. You have to think about things more and um, again, not be brilliant about it, but you do have to do some thinking and planning and finding some things that your kids are going to really um, resonate with. But I think that the heart, maybe the hardest thing is really the social isolation. Um, and again, especially if you have one, just one child that makes it particularly challenging because of boredom. Um, and that's why I was 
you know, not really joking when I said about getting a dog because dogs really can add so much and it takes a lot off of the parents, a lot of responsibility off their parents' shoulders. Um, but um, it's really that social exposure that I think is the toughest thing in finding ways, whether it's through Zoom calls or a dog or a safe little pod, uh, one or two friends that you can safely meet with and have confidence that they're gonna be responsible in terms of not exposing themselves to COVID. I think those are the, those are the main things to pay attention to. What do you think, Jasmine? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I think, you know, for kiddos under five, this may actually be so a really, you know, great for them. They get to attach to us. We're their primary caregivers. Um, and so they may walk, I think they're going to walk away from this experience having, we're going to have more of a, a healthy uh, attachment with our little ones. Um, and I think, you know, going to the idle time, you know, on the flip side, I think there's a lot of pressure on us parents, especially parents of only children to fill all their idle time, right? There's a lot of guilt wrapped into, okay, they're so bored and I need to keep, keep them uh, wrapped up in activities back to back to back. But I think there's great opportunities in idle time, in boredom, right? That's where creativity um, is, it comes, that's where they're able to hone in on their focus and concentration, their own interests. So I would avoid the trap. Yes, we want to set them up for, you know, having fun and engaging activities, of course, um, but also, you know, recognizing that, you know, idle time is also really good um, and essential for their development. So try not to overschedule them, even if, <laughs> uh, even if you guys are stuck in the house, these are great opportunities for them. And especially if you, I mean, one of the things that gets lost in the school year uh, uh, is really um, arts and crafts and creativity. And I think that um, like we can see those wonderful paintings behind Tiffany, you know, it is, it is, uh, it's a joy to the soul and it, ex and creativity is something that we, we, um, ex we benefit from in all aspects of our lives as we go forward. And so don't think of art projects as being kind of uh, insignificant or, or, or less, um, less important than learning, you know, science or, um, or arithmetic. Um, and, and when you have that, that downtime or that idle time, as, as Jasmine said, you know, try to bring tools or, or supplies that are available for your child, even if it's empty toilet paper rolls and hangers and crayons and rubber bands, you know, and give them a whole bunch of things that they can create from and make things out of and have projects out of. And, um, and so kind of in, have some structure to the idle time. It's not just here, you know, take care of yourself. It's trying to give them some tools that allow them to be organized within that idle time. Yes, love that, love that. I think it is hard to believe that we are very <laughs> near the end of our hour. <laughs> so I, I guess I will just leave with this idea of hopefully the kids will be all right and we'll all be all right too but do you all have any last bits of information or wisdom anything that you'd like to leave with the parents that are listening in this Friday afternoon or or maybe later on over the weekend well I mean for me you know the most important thing is love and uh, the relationship that you have with your family um, things will come and go um, events will come and go but your family and your caring is, is what's going to guide you and, and keep you warm and, and be a value for you for the rest of your life. And so these are very, very difficult times financially, emotionally, um, uh, in terms of uh, our health. It's, it's, it's a tough time um, and, and probably tougher than we've seen in, in quite a while. On the other hand, you know, when our grandparents or our parents were faced with a worldwide um, um, crisis, um, they had to go to war and put their lives on the line. You know, we have to stay home and watch Netflix. I mean, it's a different level of, and I don't mean to trivialize it when I say that, but it is a different level of sacrifice and there are opportunities here and let's keep focused on, on the positive things 
And even if it's just little by little, things that we can accomplish, things that we can do better, relationships that we can build, uh, routines that you can have, you know, finally now you can really read a book twice a day with your kids and you can share that fantasy of going through, you know, um, these, these wonderful uh, childhood classics with your kids. There's something important and valuable for that. It doesn't take a lot of money, but it does take time and attention. And, and those are the things you really want to um, give to yourself. And if it means you have to back away a little bit on work, sometimes that balance is, is, is important to figure out or balancing with your, with your other family members to, to not burn yourself out. Of course, you don't want to burn out in the same process. So it's not easy, but there, but there are really, um, there are really rewards that uh, people can, can feel from the situation. Yes, absolutely. And I think I think to piggyback on your your idea there that if there's one thing that I hope you remember from this is that um, the single most important thing that you can do for yourself and for your little ones and your family is kindness, right? Practicing that kindness. I think that's what it re really boils down to. I know that we are in unprecedented times. Um, we're all feeling the weight of, of current events. Um, we're not parenting in a vacuum, right? All of these things are going to impact us. And so I think also self-care, I know that word is just popping up all over the place um, and it can seem kind of cliche, but, um, you know, remembering, don't forget <laughs> how important it is to fill your cup up um, every day, even just little things um, like taking a walk by yourself or listening to your favorite song or journaling. I'm a huge fan of journaling, um, but, you know, just those little things you can do for yourself um, and make sure that you are pouring into your cup, especially during these times of such such high stress great point thank you guys i mean the chat was insane we have <laughs> so many questions um that we could not get to honestly um i wish we could have done this for three hours but um uh, we will definitely send um questions that we didn't get to to our experts and then have them answered uh with our follow-up email i want to thank Dr. Karp and Dr. Jasmine for just, you know, coming on, dropping these amazing tips um, and Tiffany for being an amazing, amazing, amazing co-host. <laughs> um, and I just want to leave you guys with the great tips that they left for us today. So have a great rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend and um, we'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Thanks have so a good much. weekend.